All right. Well, thank you, Arti, uh, for that introduction. And thank you also, Shamal, for inviting me. Uh, let me get to my PowerPoint presentation. Pick the right one. Yeah, got it. Uh, OK, so um, really pleased to, to be here today. And I wish, of course, that I could be there in person. Um, I was telling Rob and Artie that actually Manchester was the last place they visited before the lockdown. So uh, I am actually really happy to be talking to you. And I as I said, I wish it were in person. Okay, so the new global political economy of waste from China to COVID. This is kind of a, a sort of a, a rapid overview of some of the things I've worked on with respect to the book and some of the things I've worked with subsequently and some of the things maybe I will get to work on in the future. I um, am also these days an associate dean, so that has vastly restricted my time to do writing, but um, I'm hoping to spend some time when I'm no longer teaching next semester. So this is a quick outline, the global political economy of waste, just defining that, uh, looking at the waste trade, and how that has changed and what it's become more in terms of our understanding potentially than its actuality. Then I'll talk about, start talking really more about plastics as a focus and the impacts of China's operation on national sword um, about three years ago and its aftermath. The failures of global governance in this regard or what I perceive as the failures, uh, then kind of pivot a little bit to the COVID crisis, which is important because a bit like China's Operation National Sword, it also reveals both the global and the local, the very multi-scale across scalar implications of um, how we deal or fail to deal with, with our waste and recycling. Uh, a little bit about some of the countervailing forces that have been going on in, in this area. And some of this will be quite US focused. So I'm always interested to hear about what's going on elsewhere and then um, a little uh, contemplation of what a global future might look like for waste. So here we go. Okay, so I start really from the perspective of what some people have called the technosphere, others the planetary mind, and that our one study of the technosphere um, aspect of the Anthropocene estimates that the cumulative total of the material output of collective human enterprise since the Industrial Re Revolution is 30 trillion tons, much of which is still with us. Trap value of um, in a reservoir electronic waste is put by an EU study at 55 billion euros. And what we throw away, we're increasingly understanding has value. Um, I can talk about this in Q&A, but this is one of my favorite definitions of waste from one of the very first books on waste I ever read back in, in 1992 by K.A. Goulet. And this is um, a definition that at the time really captures both the discard and potentially the value aspects of waste. But thinking about the technosphere, I think really helps ground the way that I framed the book waste as um, looking at waste as a globalized resource and resource frontier. So what we throw away, these are sort of the basic themes that underlie a bunch of my work often travels the globe, but is also still around us. So it's one of the paradoxes of waste, it's everywhere. What many people don't know, but which is I'm sure not a surprise to this audience is that um, what we throw away provides a livelihood to millions around the world. Although we like to think about um, what we throw away as having value, it's still uh, piling up everywhere and still poses a considerable and magnified risks. Also, what we throw away is also subject to increased competition and conflict around access and the resources that piles of waste contain. In turn, this um, perspective underlies what I think of as the new global political economy of waste which is the production and transport of waste. And again, we can talk about my use of that word, their transformation into resources bought and sold on global markets and their final disposal 
within, across, and beyond national borders and who benefits and who bears the cost. And um, there's just a photo from um, the very famous incident in Beirut um, a number of years ago when the Lebanese government lost its contract with a global waste management firm and just waste um, kept piling up in this quote unquote river of trash as an example. And that is also an example of one of another theme that I can talk about in Q&A, which is how waste in the street cause governments to fall or at least waver. This has been, seems to be one of the universal um, aspects of waste. So to the book. And this book came out um, in a series from Polity Press actually on resources. So there's a whole other bunch of books. Some of you might've seen them in the field on fish, on timber, coltan, sugar, and so on. So when waste was proposed, uh, the first question for many people was, well, how is that a resource? And frame it to me, that was again, really, you have to ask that. But anyway, uh, I was able to create a hook for the book in thinking, although the series is about resources as increasingly um, constrained and scarce and fought over, waste is in fact probably one of our only growing global resources. So it has become what I would think of as one of our resource frontiers right now, but again, one that is all around us. Uh, so although uh, we're really recognizing the global value of wastes, um, it's also true that there are magnified risks associated now with these larger quantities, these larger movements of waste, including simply the, um, the physical risk from the size of piles of waste and landfills around the world, as well as uh, things like the impacts of a volatile market for global scrap. And this, these perspectives pose both challenges to governance as well as potential innovations and actual innovations. And again, I think this, this work that I do challenges the primary notion, at least here in the US and, and in Europe, which is that waste the traditional conventional notion that waste is something that we just want to get rid of, it vanishes, all we need to do is kind of take away and take it away and deal with it. Well, in fact, waste has many, many different afterlives. So the cases in the book um, look at waste work, used electronics, food waste, as well as plastic scrap, and ultimately um, a look at the circular economy. Here are some of my other publications, again, which are very much built on uh, from the book, or indeed proceed, um, my first book on the hazardous waste trade, waste trading among rich nations, uh, looked at how Britain was at that time, or previously in the 90s, the world's largest legal importer of hazardous waste, uh, as well as my more recent publications, uh, specifically in the conversation on um, China's crackdown on foreign garbage, as well as COVID-19 with my uh, student Jessica Haigas, and then also an article in Why is Climate Change um, from, it's actually 2019, uh, on linking waste and climate change, which might be also an object of discussion. I don't talk specifically about it in, these, in this particular talk as framed. And then my book on the environment and international relations, which is kind of a way I a set up for the way I think about global environmental governance and how it works. Critical insights, just to summarize um, some of the insights from my book that I've collected uh, as I talk about it. And one is to do with recycling and at a local and a global level, that it is not just a function of environmental values or of the technology, but also of markets. That recycling, um, market, for recycling markets for what is recycled, the product from recycling absolutely necessary for it to work. When it comes to the trade itself, um, demand matters potentially more than supply. And the traditional narrative of the waste trade, whether it be hazardous waste, e-waste, et cetera, of perpetrator north and victim south no longer holds. Third, that the local and the global are very much intertwined. And um, the example of China's Operation National Sword, which I'll get to, shows how very rapidly decisions made in Beijing affect what Berkeley residents or residents of any community um, 
put out on their curves each week for collection. And this is a great example, actually, of the cross-scale nature of, of global environmental problems. And then also um, the changing face of global waste activism and looking beyond sort of the activists like the Basel Action Network campaigning at the global level to look at the emergence of transnational waste picker alliances and a right to repair movement. And then finally, how in this, the wake of these um, insights and findings, how do we govern safety and justice issues in the wake of um, a globalized waste economy that isn't going away anytime soon? I'll add that one insight of mine that hasn't changed from when I wrote my dissertation in the, in the 1990s to now is that no matter how much we try and stop the waste trade, it's um, not going to stop, nor do we seem to be able to do it. So how do we live with it? So thinking about the waste trade, I've actually, one of the few things I've written this year is actually revisiting um, what the waste trade looked like as far as we saw it in the uh, 1970s and 80s and how that relates to the present. So this little timeline, I think, outlines the fact that the global waste economy is probably older than we thought. So the first way that it emerged was in through toxic waste dumping on developing countries, um, highly visible in the 70s and 80s, and one of the driving forces for the Basel Convention on the hazardous waste trade, which again has become increasingly more relevant in the wake of uh, global, globalized plastics. Electronic wastes then, or use electronics, as I, I try to refer to them as emerged as a major trend in the global waste trade from the 1990s onwards, as the number of appliances and devices that we have continued to skyrocket. Then also in the 2000s, I put this there, even though um, the global trade in quote unquote good scrap, like iron, metals, other scrap that can basically be easily recycled into uh, what it was previously. Um, so metals are a big focus of that goes back a couple of centuries, but really took off in the 2000s as the Chinese economy started growing. Um, then in, in the 2000s, although we weren't really aware of it until quite recently um, on the whole was a growing international trade in plastics, paper, and textiles. Uh, plastics and paper specifically primarily went to China, but not always. And then um, what my, uh, I guess, colleague in the discard studies world, Adam Minter, calls the global garage sale, um, the way that clothes, secondhand cars, used bikes, also traverse the globe, often through, at least in cars and bikes, through networks of immigrants, and clothes uh, shipment around the world is um, one of the examples of, um, of, of uh, dumping of um, what we throw away on local markets. And uh, I'm increasingly intrigued. Other people are working on this, on the, the um, influence of big charity, quote unquote. So let's um, focus on the plastic waste trade. And the fact that plastic scrap, for many years, the US and other globalized um, industrialized economies had gotten away, gotten out of um, revamping their own recycling systems by shipping their plastic waste to China. And this was highly cost effective um, because basically we could ship waste and scrap back in the container ships that brought that plastics to us. And China's decision in 2017, implemented in 2018, to severely crack down on how much plastic and paper scrap uh, they imported really um, brought to focus um, both the crisis of recycling in industrialized countries, but also globally, the local global connections in the waste economy, and also the contingency of scrap value. Uh, for me, plastic, Waste or scrap is interesting because partly it is um, partly it's um, something that is uh, both of value. It can be used, but it's a highly contingent resource. It does not recycle well at all. So I'll talk a little bit about this case in the context of the growing plastics trade. Between 
1992 and 2018, China took cumulatively 42% of the world's plastic scrap. In other parts of the world, it was much higher. In California, for instance, it was well over half, possibly three quarters of our plastic scrap. And you can see here how that uh, trade boomed really from um, the early 2000s when China joined the, the World Trade Organization and through its years of growth. Uh, you see a peak in 2012 in part because China started cracking down on global plastics in 2013 with something called Operation Green Fence, which was really an enforcement of existing customs regulations. And it was about this time that I had a senior uh, thesis student at Berkeley who was doing her thesis on what happened to the plastics that we put in recycling bins in on campus and, and in the city of Berkeley and discovered they went to China. So that was totally fascinating for me and um, informed this work of mine ever since. So the bonanza for our country is just to be able to, to, to get rid of our plastics and for um, local uh, recycling authorities and companies to gain a lot of revenue from this trade ended on March 1st, 2018 with Operation National Sword um, announced by the China environment industry as um, no more foreign garbage. And Although it wasn't exactly a ban, plastic and paper scrap had to meet very strict contamination limits, limits that were not actually reachable at that time. The US uh, response and the US scrap industry, the global scrap industry response was uh, that this would have mammoth impacts on recycling. Uh, to quote, this is from a, a leading industry uh, group, the end of recycling as we know it. But in fact, that phrase itself was recycled across a lot of different venues. Uh, more accurately, uh, what it generated was a massively overdue recycling reckoning, which in the US we are certainly still um, going through, both in terms of how and what is collected um, and how it is dealt with, from uh, particularly from municipal solid waste, um, but also how we're starting to think more about um, how to take plastics out of the out of production and how to reduce particularly single-use plastics in the first place. So we are moving back up the, um, the production cycle as well. Now Beijing's motives, I think are more complicated than are often depicted in the press uh, and in, by NGOs, which is uh, again, that sort of victim narrative. And I will say Beijing has certainly um, encouraged this in, in many ways to say we are no longer the world's dumping ground. Um, you know, you evil Northern countries, you take your plastic and, and dispose of it yourself or stop using it. Um, so there were very strong environmental motives on the part of Beijing uh, in terms of wanting to reduce both um, contamination and the quantity of plastic waste entering the country. This documentary, Plastic China, um, was highly influential at the time. It was being it's shown it was shown in the West basically, and I think mostly in film festivals and limited circulation. It's worth looking up. You can get it in a lot of streaming uh, platforms, including YouTube. Uh, but there's every indication it was seen at the very highest level of Beijing pol um, political circles and influenced their um, decision. I, China is also, I think, you could, there's an international reputation dimension. Um, around becoming the world's uh, economic superpower, which is also to say that to be a global superpower, it's not just about economics or military, there's also something of a reputational normative um, factor in all of this. So again, being like a dumping ground for global waste, and some of this also goes back to the electronic waste trade um, became, um, was significant to Beijing, not just for environmental reasons, but for reputational regions. And um, also there was a strong element of domestic politics. And um, that in part had to do, I think, with the fact that a lot of tax revenue was being lost in the way that um, waste were being um, import plastic and paper were being imported and certainly an element of control. Again, I'm extrapolating a little bit from what happened with electronic wastes um, in China, but I should note that um, the idea was not to get rid of plastic uh, recycling, but rather to supplant the international plastic with um, with domestically produced plastic scrap, uh, making the companies that actually use this very unhappy because typically much lower quality. 
So what happened um, in the short term over the next few years, um, we're really starting to be at a point where we can evaluate this more now. Uh, but again, COVID, unfortunately, um, huge, uh, huge uh, sort of wrench in the machinery there. So we saw more landfill and incineration, depending where you are, a lot more landfill here in the United States. A lot more public awareness. Like I'm sure many of you have heard of this case. Uh, I've always been surprised at um, how many people that I talk to in general audiences know a bit about it, um, along with concern about plastics in the oceans, which has reached a peak um, in recent, reached a peak in recent years and translated to a lot of single use plastic bans or restrictions. It also led to policy changes across the um, United States and the industrialized world. Um, less curbside pickup um, on the negative side and a lot more expensive curbside pickup, but also um, helped to support more local and regional zero waste initiatives. Um, it also helped generate technology and innovation. Um, a lot of talk now about how to bring more machinery, even artificial intelligence, um, learning, um, technology into just the basics of, of sorting plastics at a materials recovery facility on MRF. But also plastics were diverted to other Asian countries through the miracles of rapid adaptation of global capitalism. Until Asian countries started very publicly to refuse imports. And in May, this is an example in May 2019, Malaysia's environment minister, Yeo Bi Yin, announcing that they would start sending um, bales of plastic ship waste shipments back to where they came. So this became a very public trend that summer and helped generate and help support um, uh, action at the global governance level. So governance, uh, local to global, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about global in a sec, but um, I've talked a little bit about some of the local recycling infrastructure and markets moving very slowly, restricting single-use consumer plastics in states, cities, and towns, fostering education, getting rid of wish cycling, as I put it there. Uh, we actually have here in the United States a whole raft of um, about, oh, I don't know, six six um, proposed bills and about 12 to 13 other pieces of federal legislation that address recycling plastics directly. We are one of the most decentralized countries in the world when it comes to recycling. Uh, very little existing federal legislation. I think something around um, cathode ray tubes and then um, outside the, but, and super fund in dealing with hazardous waste sites, but nothing really on recycling. Um, although I'll note that the, one of the last pieces of legislation signed by um, our former president was actually called the Save Our Seas Act, which was about restricting plastic flow into the oceans. So that either tells you, um, that might also tell you a lot about how ironically plastic and other kinds of waste is a very bipartisan concern here, although um, manifesting in different ways. And then in, in creating and amending international law. So it's, it's um, not an exaggeration to call Operation National Sword a seismic shift in global recycling markets that told us a lot about our own recycling practices and policies at all levels, but also um, started to filter up to the global level. And at the global level, uh, we have a treaty that had been moribund actually for a long time. And I, uh, you know, it's what I study. There's very few of us historically who studied the Basel Convention in 1989 on transboundary movement of hazardous waste and their disposal. And it's a treaty that was designed to stop trade the most hazardous waste, um, particularly from North to South, initially to manage, um, but then to actually ban it. Now, Again, not terribly successful um, in terms, for example, that the waste trade ban amendment um, had not by mid 2019 been actually entered into force despite being adopted in 1995 and a lot of problems there. Although I would argue some normative impact, particularly on the most egregious forms of waste dumping. But in activists were looking for a place at the global level to talk about plastics, given that really um we uh don't we we uh, don't have much prospect of for example a global plastics treaty in the near future so this is one of the options so in may 2019 
at COP14 of the Basel Convention, um, 186 countries agreed to add plastics to Annex 2, which is the categories of waste that require special considerations. So there are three annexes that list categories of waste in under the Basel Convention, might be a few more than that, but the critical ones are Annex 1, hazardous waste that are actually contaminated and plastics go into that. Annex 2, um, where countries may decide themselves to um, adopt unilateral uh, bans on imports of, of this waste or restrictions, and then um, waste that are, are less hazardous. Anyway, that's, it's, it's, it's very contentious as to what goes on and off these, these annexes. However, um, these, this, this um, amendment was seen as a huge step forward um, for the Basel regime and for controlling plastics. A lot of um, cheers from, from um, activists noting in particular that the US as a non-party to the convention is no longer allowed to um, ship waste to um, another party in the treaty and obviously with 186 countries signing that, that's a lot of countries the US supposedly cannot ship to. And so this is huge victory um, um, in terms of global governance and a lot of excitement around the Basel Convention. So this is where I put my global environmental governance hat on and um, really talk about the fact that I, I don't think this was as much of a victory as was proclaimed at the time. Um, I just cite this, uh, I went to a, a global plastics recycling convention shortly after the ban was implemented. I mean, the, the amendment was implemented and the um, BRS, the Basel Rotterdam Stockholm conventions who worked together, the UN human, the UN human rights liaison, Rolf Pyatt was talking there, uh, very much the party line, um, speaking from someone who knew more about it than most people in the room. But it was just, he was giving a, a plenary talk. And this was just so heartrending that someone who was in the plastics recycling industry just stood up and said, but plastics aren't hazardous. And it was, he had no answer to that, which I thought was kind of fascinating, but, um, but really kind of reflects uh, the view of the plastics recycling industry who see themselves as providing a valuable service in many ways. But just to think too about the structure of the Basel Convention, relies on a very weak form of prior informed consent. So we're not really talking, especially with the Annex 2, sorry about the, the in the weeds detail, um, special ways. It's not about banning, it's about creating prior informed consent. And it is a particularly weak mechanism under the Basel Convention. Um, and there's also massive loopholes. Article 11 of the treaty allows for bilateral agreements between parties and non-parties, between Northern and Southern parties to actually, um, to continue any kind of waste shipment, including plastics. And of course the United States has many of these such agreements. And then again, the Basel ban, the ban amendment entered into force in, in late 2019 and it actually doesn't totally cover um, those Annex two ways. So it's complicated and it's really an, a big over-exaggeration for, um, for activists to talk about this being a huge victory, especially as international plastic waste shipments are very far from over. I didn't have time to look up the UK data, but I've got a couple of other kind of hard to um, read slides. So 2019, um, these are the top importers that spread out a lot, a lot more um, developed countries. It's clearly not as much um, visibly a shipment to developing countries, but you see a lot of um, maybe familiar name, country names there, um, Vietnam, Malaysia, China. I mean, particularly Hong Kong still it was not behind the green fence, Republic of Korea. This was all before um, a lot of um, things were being implemented. Then you go to 2020, and I really apologize for that. I have to work on, on the labels of, of this uh, slide, but you're still seeing incredibly extensive trade. These are the top 35 um, reporters. I pulled this from UN Comtrade data yesterday. And the countries of particular interest, the top country there is Turkey, um, then you've got Netherlands, Malaysia, Vietnam, um, again, China and Hong Kong is still up there. Uh, you go down to countries like Indonesia, Thailand, Slovenia, um, you end up around um, Azerbaijan, Myanmar and South Africa there at the bottom. And I'm happy to provide an enlarged portion of this. Now I will say that the quantities 
of um, plastic waste being shipped are vastly smaller annually, but a quick back of the envelope calculation of how much is on this, um, on this uh, graph here is actually adds up to close to, I'd say about two thirds to three quarters of the amount that China was taking in at the very peak of its imports. So it's not insignificant. And a lot of, you can talk to companies in California, for example, who are still shipping to Malaysia and swearing that everything's fine. They know everyone they're shipping to, and of course it's not a problem. So again, we're still dealing with the transfer of plastic waste around the world. And, um, and I think this highlights uh, a real problem with conventional global waste governance, which is echoed in uh, some domestic and local policy, that, that the governance, and I'm actually shifting a little bit because e-waste provides the best pictures around this, uh, that the global governance of the waste trade is based on what we see in this map here on the right-hand side, that it's these large arrows going from um, the US and Europe to China, to India, to um, countries in Africa and that this is primarily dumping of waste. But, but this picture is actually very far from complete. And I'll show you why it's not complete. <laughs> These maps are from my colleague, Josh Lepowski at Memorial University in Canada, who's done a lot of work on, on pretty much what I've been doing historically with hazardous waste. And I draw on his work in my book, which is to really show that it's much more complicated than we think. There's a lot of South South trade. There's a lot of movement of different waste around um, different um, parts of the world and transiting networking and so on. Um, here's another one <laughs> that is just as complicated. And I can again provide the website for the more, um, it's an it's a, um, interactive version. You can actually isolate a lot of what's going on here. But the point is, this is what we're dealing with. Um, we're also dealing with, um, and apologies, I, I don't actually have the direct slide on this, but not everything is being dumped. That a lot of studies show from um, people who are active in these sites, academics, in these parts of the world, um, some NGOs and certainly some journalists that although we see these images of like blazing incinerated e-waste, black smoke rising to the sky is only really part of the picture. And that what's actually going on outside of this incineration part are actually very active refurbishing and recycling markets. In other words, it's not really all about us dumping our waste. It's about demand for these products in these countries, a lot of which are shipped from the non-traditional countries that we would think of or regulated under the Basel Convention. So there's a lot of ways in which the way global governance is done and local governance really doesn't fit uh, what's going on in the world. And we need to think in this way about the transit of waste as goods that carry immense risk. And if you, I would say probably the, the biggest thing to target is actually the health and safety of the people um, wherever they are who are dismantling this waste and the toxics that are in those. So I think that, um, that what I talk about in general and what other people are, are working on um, on specific case studies is that the global waste trade is not how it's depicted to be. And we really need to work with what we have in order to make it safer. That means if we can work a safety, it also means designing products that can be more easily disassembled um, and reused. And that might again lead to a discussion of right to repair legislation. So pivoting a little bit, um, when I was starting to talk a lot about plastics and the plastic waste trade and, and my book and so on, I was dealing with what we thought was like an upward trajectory in terms of legislation and action and awareness, especially at the local level around single use plastics. Um, Berkeley, for instance, had just introduced this really kind of revolutionary, at least, you know, of course with Berkeley, it's always revolutionary, but a legislation to really stop all kinds of single use foodware uh, that in fact, my student Jessica and I were working with, uh, partnering with the Ecology Center, the local main NGO that's dealing with recycling to build a toolkit for other um, jurisdictions that were wanting to do the same thing. But then along came COVID and really, 
I think undermine so much, of course, that COVID has revealed about how our world works and not least was um, its impact um, as far as we were concerned immediately on um, progress towards zero waste, um, the banning of reusable bags and mugs, the fact that plastic bags appeared in grocery stores super fast with logos, um, new legislation around the country was stalled and other new restrictions were suspended or, or not enforced. And of course we saw a big rise in um, single use um, PPE, personal protective equipment litter on the streets and in the oceans. Now, um, it was not hard even uh, in summer 2020 to realize that the big kind of fingerprints all over this were actually from the plastics industry. Uh, we knew even then that surfaces were not really a major mode of transmission and we did not really need to wrap everything in multiple layers of plastics. But um, this public letter that is on the bottom right of the little montage there is from the Plastics Association talking about how um, the CDC or the Department of Health and Human Services needed to eliminate all this dangerous moves towards eliminating single use plastic. So not only we do, do we need plastic, we need it to be single use. So initially, no matter what was going on, uh, it was quite obvious that there were other actors going on in, in this. And this is something we're still having to combat. We may be moving forward from the pandemic, but the plastic industry is still very much in control. Then COVID has also undermined waste worker health and livelihoods in both the formal and informal sectors. I'll highlight the lockdowns in India and elsewhere that shut waste pickers away from their livelihoods, creating poverty, hunger, and a lot of, of serious problems. Uh, waste workers, um, both formal and informal sectors are likely to be more vulnerable to infection. They work close together with so low, little social distancing. They can be um, easily exposed, but also because uh, waste workers in the US tend to be from um, more vulnerable populations, full stop, African-American um, workers, uh, workers that are not do not have as much access to, um, to healthcare and um, maybe more vulnerable to, to maybe more vulnerable to pre-existing conditions. Likewise, in the global south, workers who are often older, often iller, because this is still a very dangerous form of livelihood. So more vulnerable to both infection and the severe forms of the disease. And um, waste, especially household waste, has become more contaminated. And uh, that is not really talking about the disease, but the fact that people are throwing everything out. Household waste has massively increased. There's a lot more dangerous medical equipment. One of the things I was reading about this was talking about the prevalence, the wider prevalence of, of, of uh, needles, because uh, if people are injecting themselves with some of these like quack cures, that is also both in the North, but especially in the South has actually reappeared in the, in the waste stream. In the US, the um, Solid Waste Association of North America had to fight to declare waste work essential. But again, workers here on the front lines of infection and indeed um, COVID infections throughout um, sanitary uh, workers have shut down waste collection in towns and cities around the country. And then medical waste is now more likely to be burned or dumped. And um, that is both a not particularly toxic medical waste of, of gloves and masks, the PPE that we use, but also uh, medical waste in hospitals that's been much harder to collect. So you've also got these mammoth um, impacts on the global um, waste work sector, informal and formal. Um, one thing I should also say is that I, I'm really interested in how we're seeing a blurring of, of lines between the formal and informal sectors, a formalization of waste collection in parts of the global south, but an informalization in the US um, that's, that's becoming quite visible, especially in the wake of um, economic hardship, uh, scrap theft from houses and so on is also up around here. And then COVID also disrupted scrap supply chains along with every other supply chain um, as lockdowns froze domestic collections, disrupted global trade, trade that was already fragile. Um, demand and supply dried up as construction and demolition pretty much halted. However, it is bouncing back pretty quickly um, in part because raw materials, mines that shut down, 
other um, ways of producing metals are ramping up a lot more slowly and scrap is something that's much more easily extractable and shippable um, for use in production. So the scrap industry right now is pretty buoyant. There's been some good news as we transition out. Um, I highlight Pepsi's recent decision to reduce virgin plastic use across all of its brands by 2030 as one of the actions that exemplifies um, moves around the greatest, the largest multinational uh, companies that produce plastics that are very much being pushed by the Alan MacArthur Foundation, World Wildlife Fund, the plastic packs, where one of the areas you're seeing a lot of this, um, these, this impetus is coming from these large foundations, these large NGOs, as part of a broader circular economy narrative. Um, there's a soda stream uh, right there because Pepsi now owns soda stream, but I also feel like my own soda stream as I am addicted to sparkling water is one of the most environmental things that I do in my life. Anyway, you're also seeing finally some of these moves um, towards, for example, just little things, supposedly little things like those wretched chasing arrows on most plastics. I've got the number one here, um, and that is actually a good plastic that's short in supply. It can be used for recycling, but you see a number seven, a six, a five, and most people think, oh, it's recyclable. And in fact, it's a signal to um, collectors that in fact, it's not recyclable. That's a, so anyway, so getting rid of that would be a nice sort of symbolic move. But again, you see these moves from sort of the global economy right down to kind of local practical stuff. And I will just say quickly on the Pepsi decision that 50% of PepsiCo plastic is still quite a lot of plastic. However, and this specifically talks about the US situation, um, I haven't done really enough work to know how much this is happening elsewhere, possibly less because I think the European Union government, uh, the European Union is much more powerful in this regard. But these two maps show um, plastic bag uh, restrictions around the United States in 2018 and 2020. And unfortunately, the red does not stand for an increase in plastic bag restrictions. Instead, the red stands for states that have enacted um, preemptive legislation. In other words, um, forbidding its local jurisdictions from enacting plastic bag restrictions. And this number clearly has grown significantly. Um, you might also note there's a particular political uh, makeup of the states that are red uh, there, which is possibly the origin of the red and the blue. Anyway, so this is something that I tell my students we really have to start combating as if they ask, what can we do? It's like, well, if you live in one of these red states, then you need to really start kind of campaigning about these particular measures, which are clearly sponsored by the grocery bag of the plastic industry. And also just the fact that this is a sort of pre-COVID picture, the way that the price of plastics has slumped since the start of 2018, um, a shift away on the part of the fossil fuel extraction industry from fossil fuels to uh, petrochemicals um, as again, another little climate connection here that they're seeing the writing on the wall for um, large scale use of fossil fuels. So let's start producing plastics instead. And again, that's a lot of concomitant risks, not just around waste, but just the environmental impacts and the climate impacts of plastic production. So we're facing still, as we try and move to this post COVID era, a lot of structural challenges that have not gone away and political challenges. But just to sort of draw to a conclusion, um, do discards have of all kinds have a global future? Uh, yes, and maybe this is not a bad thing, um, but we still need to figure out how to effectively govern this new resource frontier. And ongoing challenges include the retransition back to pre-COVID gains and building on the government governance shifts that were being made and perhaps um, figuring out innovative ways of doing that, um, dealing with the plastic industry, pushing for the right to repair, um, and really understanding some critical trends that aren't so much part of the mainstream um, that Waste is inherently cross or multi-scalar. Um, waste work trends are um, needing, as I've, I've already sketched out, I think need to be better understood globally as well as activism. 
and also understanding the global waste or global scrap trade in terms of demand. In other words, I think a lot of what we knew needs to be driven by this understanding of wastes as a resource frontier, um, but also as, um, as a frontier that contains a lot of risks and a lot of potential for conflict as people now scramble to, um, to uh, exploit the value. So I think that there's this is a, a, a fascinating world to continue working in. Um, I, by the way, that photo, I, um, I popped out like at about a half an hour before I started talking to take a photo of my very own local waste economy. And I'm always encouraging people to look at that. Um, the alleyway, I actually live in the Chicago area um, behind our building showing all the various um, uh, trash cans and also um, I'm going to have to go pick up some stuff from her. There's a woman who is clearing out that double garage of all of her stuff as she's moving to Colorado and just kind of having it out there for free. And I think that's very much sort of an example of some of the things that, that we need to do. But anyway, I feel a bit guilty about taking that photo. So I'll pop down. And of course, a lot of her stuff is pretty trashy. So <laughs> not very useful. But anyway, but that also shows this alleyway is where we put things out and pick up trucks. I don't know how they do it, but often within seconds, if it's valuable in any way, someone has come through with a pickup truck and taken it. It's quite amazing in the way that our local waste economy works. And again, you're seeing um, this intersection between uh, formal and informal um, because Chicago's um, waste collection system is notoriously terrible, um, which goes along with some of its general um, reputation around its governance. So also finally, I'll skip through this quickly, happy to come back to it, but um, this is another thing I'm trying to work on. And I think disaster waste is becoming more and more prevalent. Again, another connection with climate change, climate change causing waste, as well as waste production influencing um, the way that our climate is changing. And um, I think it's an overlooked, fascinating, complex, rapidly growing category of wastes under the climate emergency, but it's unclear how effectively we are dealing with it or preventing it now. So again, this hopefully will be a project over the next year or so to work on. So finally questions, and because I always use my own photos, I took these last year um, in a trip to Santa Cruz and a tour of a, a materials recovery facility, um, a local sort of nonprofit one, not a huge waste management company one. And you can tell it is Santa Cruz because um, uh, the MRF had an entire wall full of um, discarded surfboards. Uh, so with that, I will stop sharing and um, apologies for talking longer than I thought and transition to questions.